All right, everybody, part two of that same reaction, New Mexico Chris Bryant. Starting off where we left off. By using inmates as snitches, officers extracted information with which they could anticipate trouble. By labeling inmates as snitches, they created a climate of suspicion and fear in the general prison population. It was divide and rule. So you heard what they said administration was doing there, huh? He throwing jackets, um, probably even doing false paperwork, putting rat snitch jackets on people that weren't actually snitches. So you can understand how this could really cause a lot of, you know, inner in, inner warfare. You know, it's as simple as you pull an inmate out, put him on in protective custody for, for a week, put him right back in. Nay, you know what I mean? Or... Uh, Ride a fake kite that came from him or something, and then uh, say like, "Look, look to another inmate. Like, look, look, somebody slid us this kite." <clears throat> so it gets real, uh, real grimy, if you will. Which administrations have been known to do in prisons all across the United States? They've always been known. That's one of the ways that they keep stay on top and in control of facilities. Like they just said, divide and conquer. You keep them against each other. Uh, they, well, they don't compete each other against each other. Mercifully in California between the Sureños and Norteños and Bulldogs and yeah, so <clears throat> that's nothing new. What the snitch system did was to deflect the hatred and resentment inmates felt for the authorities towards the inmates held here in cell block four. But turning inmate on inmate was a high-risk strategy of control. The penitentiary had become a tinderbox, only needing a spark to ignite, which the adjacent cell block, five, would provide. Some very hardcore, dangerous inmates were in cell block five. Then they decided they had to do some renovation work in cell block five, some major construction uh, repair work in cell block five. And so all those inmates in cell block five had to be moved someplace else. I don't know who made the decisions and how they made them, but I know that many of the inmates from cell block five were moved as a block into dormitory E2. Very dangerous inmates all put into a dormitory where it's all one big open area and crowded with inmates, about 25%. So you can imagine with that call being made, of course, I'm no genius. There was obviously something crooked probably going on with the administration. Uh, maybe a guard, maybe uh, and could have been maybe uh, an inmate, possibly paying one of the guards to make that move. You know, something happened there in my mind. No, it doesn't just happen uh, coincidentally, like he said. He said bad move. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe he doesn't know. But I, my brain, first thing it comes to is that nobody, not even a blind man, could, would do that unless there's underlying circumstances. Now, remember, this is Mike's world, man. I give my opinion. I'm sitting here giving my opinion on the thing with you guys and giving facts that I've heard. This is how I do. You know, I get, uh, I hope you guys enjoy watching it with me, me giving my uh, five cents when you ask for two. Yeah, you know what I mean? But uh, this is how I enjoy the video, uh, watching it with you. So my, my opinion on that, and I haven't heard this. This is one of the things that I haven't heard from somebody. But, you know, from, from what he just said and what I take in with my own common sense is something happened. They were placed in that block, not by accident, but by uh, deliberately, but, for, you know, for so, uh, what reasons unknown. <clears throat> the other 75% weaklings that were subservient to the hardcore. And these hardcore pretty much left alone to run that unit. A week after the move of that hardcore to E2, newcomer Gary Nelson arrived at the penitentiary. They assign you to a unit as soon as you get fingerprinted and everything. And I remember, as clear as could be even this day, the guard walking over there and picking up the phone and saying, I've got Nelson, where do you want to put him? And he said, uh, and then I heard the guard say, are you sure? He said, okay, if you say so. And he turned around, looked at me and said, could you live at E2? And not being from New Mexico, I really couldn't tell you very much about their prison system at all. He, I just looked at him and said, E2, B2, what difference would it make? On the night of Friday, February the 1st, 1980, 
There were 12 officers supervising 1,157 inmates. Yeah, you guys hear that? 12 officers watching 1,157 inmates. That's roughly what? 200 officers to an inmate? Or I mean 200 uh, inmates to an officer? Or something like that? 200 uh, to uh, one ratio? That's no wonder they got overtook. And that's just incredible. You get you could get over overthrown by a damn a pack of you know what I mean a blind dogs at that with that no with those numbers. The exact population was not known. It was really tricky doing your counts at night. You're thinking to yourself, I hope they're asleep. You don't want to turn the lights on because you don't want them to wake up. You're going with a flashlight, hoping the batteries are going to be strong enough to illuminate your way so that you won't step on someone's face as you're tiptoeing in among them trying to count bodies. Uh, it gets very hairy. And uh, because it was frightening to do that, I know some officers did not even do the counts at night. They'd call in a number that was called in the time before. And hopefully no one's gotten out since then. The newly arrived hardcore in E2 had been drinking illicit beer since the early evening. It was a typical night in the penitentiary in New Mexico. There was nothing pre-planned about this. Uh, people talk about, yeah, they're going to be a riot, they're going to be this. Just nothing at all. And we're all sitting around playing cards, doing things. All of a sudden, uh, somebody got up, jumped up and said, uh, Danny Ray Macias. I mean, it's well documented at this point. I said that, uh, hey, tired of this place. When they come to count, if they don't like that door, we're going to jump them and take over this place. And again... This kind of plays into what I was saying earlier. If you guys watched my last video on, on, on part one, I was saying that at this time there was a lot of rebellious, really wild dudes that would kill people next to them. There wasn't like, oh, they're an organized crew or they're an organized crew. And there were rebellious guys who wanted to kill everyone around them. Um, there was very little organization, you know what I mean, at this time. And so that plays into what I was saying with uh, them being less organized and having a plan. To attack but more so a wild hair up their ass if you want to call it that just, just getting crazy that that makes sense <clears throat> anybody stays in bed's gonna get hurt at 109 a.m on saturday february the second prison officers moved to order the prison's south end to do a final check of the dormitories a process which many of them detested and feared in order to speed their work up the most basic security procedures such as locking the doors of the dormitories behind them, were, as usual, ignored. And that, just like any job, <clears throat> I'm no, like I said, no professional or anything, but I can tell you that, that this is a dangerous job, obviously, more than others. But with any job, I, I've worked a lot of jobs myself. Uh, one of the things that happens, that negligence usually comes in from um, com comfort comfortability. Uh, comfortability. I guess if that's a word <laughs> from getting too comfortable, you know, uh, you forget to snap on your seatbelt on the forklift. You forget to do this or that, you know, you get so comfortable in your everyday stuff. And then you stop thinking about what you're doing. Bam. Right then. That's when it hits you. You know, when you stop taking that extra precaution because you do it every day in, every day out, every day in, every day out. So you don't get, get that extra thought. You stop locking the door. You stop doing that extra double lockout or tag out, that extra safety procedure, that that pick up things correctly because you're picking things up all day. And then just when you thought you, you've you been doing it enough years, that's when it gets to you. I remember laying there on my bed thinking, boy, I sure hope he locks that door. That'll stop this. And they didn't like that door. So they had uh, two guards, one on the opposite side from me was counting, and one on my side was a lieutenant. I believe his name was Anaya. And Lieutenant Anaya was walking up, and as he got near my bed, someone ran and jumped him. They grabbed the other guard. At the same time, someone had run and uh, kicked open the door all the way and grabbed the guard at the front door and had all three of them at that point. Uh, took the keys. Uh, took so remember now, we got 1,200 uh, inmates in the facility, 12 guards in the facility at, you know what I mean, at max. And three, he just said, of these 12 guards, which leaves them only with what? Nine? 
nine guards are going to be left in the, in the facility after they go, and they got three of them under their control right now. Took their clothes off. People started putting bandanas over their face and everything, and I mean, it was payback time. On the blue side of me. And, you know, it, it's as simple as a line from an old rap song, you know? A when it's on, motherfucker, then it's on, G. A when it's on, motherfucker, then it's on, G. You know, when it's like when it's popping off, it's sometimes it's like go. It's a fight or flight response is what they say humans have. You know what I mean? Which means either you're going in or you're going out. And, um, of course, the way these guys are programmed, the way they think, they're locked up, they're going in. And they're going to go and, you know, like you said, a lot of dudes, see what you're going to see throughout this video. A lot of guys are doing life. Lifers in here, 30 years. Why wouldn't you go if you got a chance to uh, try to up, up, up? rebel against it possibly get out make a change even get at somebody that ratted you out possibly um it's not like you're going to be going anywhere anytime soon take advantage of the that's what um inmates are known for doing taking advantage of situations you know if it, from the contraband to wet you know what i mean weapons uh escapes assaults it's all crime you know opportun uh, they're opportunists When the darkness takes control, you start looking for a reason to take your life. And I want to say something real quick about what I just said because it just hit me. I did say they're opportunists, but that carries from, from the streets, from the Kayas. <clears throat> Same thing on the streets. You know, that's one that's one thing a lot of these guys are criminals in here. Well, they're all criminals mostly. Uh, robbers, dope dealers, and something you learn in that life is again is, is is that is that same thing. You know what I mean? Opportunity. A car, right? Nobody around. Nice car. Windows down. Keys in it. You take it. Uh, everybody's asking for uh, dope, so you sell it to them. You supply it. Uh, you see what your houses look like. That you can hit them. No one's there. You you jack them. Opportunity. Uh, criminal mentality. So, of course, they're going to take advantage of the numbers of not love them knocking the door behind them. You know, opportunists. Remember. And this is where I was having breakfast. Oh, about 1.30 in the morning with uh, Tonya V. Hill. That's when we heard I was going to leave. And he says, have a cup of coffee with me. I said, oh, OK, I guess I could take another five minutes. That's where we heard a really strange, loud grumbling noise. The strangest thing you could hear at 1.30. It was 1.45 in the morning. That's when we came out to the hall, and we saw literally hundreds of inmates just pouring out of the dormitories. And I said, my God, what is going on? I thought maybe a fight had broken out into the hallways. And I said, no, it's just not reasonable. A fight that big could break loose. I was going to rush down and try and close those grills over there, but it seemed like as though somebody was guarding those grills dressed in an officer's uniform. And I didn't recognize the individuals. Uh, and then I saw, that's when I saw that they were kicking an individual, I believe it came out to be Juan Bustos, an officer, literally rolling him down the hallway uh, with kicks. And, and, and it was, I would say, anywhere between 100 and 200 individuals. And um, they were just filling out. And it was just mass chaos. And that's when we exited up towards the control center. And um, I banged on the windows to the control center. And I head out back up to the north side <clears> of the facility. I want to remind people, fo folks here, you guys watching this, you might not sure, just to uh, reiterate what, what we're seeing here. This is one of the officers, you know, uh, was a, a new hire, a guard in 1980. And they're going over, they're going through the empty prison of the worst, you know, um, prison riot in American history. It happened in New Mexico at uh, Santa Fe, you know, the north, the Murph. So uh, that's what we're going over here instead of going out the front door. The rioting inmates were also making for the control center because it contained the keys for every lock in the penitentiary. Security in the control center was so important that it was always manned by two guards and protected by a sheet of specially reinforced glass installed just two weeks previously. Now this, this I remember hearing about from um, 
the inmate from some homies, you know what I mean? Homies, dads and shit. They were getting through that. They were, they had a, a, a stool. They had like a fire extinguisher. Uh, fools, fools were just elbowing it, elbowing it. Like they weren't, they weren't giving up on that one. That was a, a must. Uh, they got in front of the control center and demanded uh, that they, you know, open it up. They, were, of course, they refused. They weren't going to open it up. Uh, I mean, they've been trained that way not to open it up. They were kicking the hostage. I don't know what the hostage's name was, but they were kicking him, you know, threatening him and, and threatening to cut his throat. Eventually, uh, took a fire extinguisher, broke the window. I mean, at first, they threw the window. Uh, I mean, you got this supposedly bulletproof glass. It may very well have been bulletproof, but, uh, it wasn't fire extinguisher proof. He got it and he threw it with such force and might at the control center window that it sort of like penetrated and stuck in the window. And that's when they said, well, that, they threw it again. And that's when they actually created a little hole. And that's when they started sticking pipes in the window and creating a larger hole and larger hole. And that's how they got in the control center. Once they were in the control center, they essentially had the institution. And, all the key and you heard him right there. Boom, you're in the control center. Now you now have keys to every door in the facility, the front gates, the back gates. Like he said, they essentially had, you know, full control of the institution at that moment. And when you're an inmate, you can imagine this moment, this feeling. Woo! See, but what what's happening right now that you don't know, and then and that the guys in, in C block don't know, which is the SNY yard, the rat yard, is uh is that their their times are very, you know. They're about to meet their maker. And uh, and that's real. You know, I'm not laughing about that. I'm not joking. Not that they say that they didn't deserve it, because most of them did. A lot of the people had it coming. Shout out to the homie Snoops from SNM, you know, all the people that were basically breaking it down for me and letting me know the way uh the way they re the really good Vatos didn't bite the bullet in this in this riot. A lot of people say that it was innocent to his inmates, and I I'm here to tell you that's incorrect. If you guys know that the way uh, prisoners govern themselves. The, the people that, that bit the bullet were guys that had to come. They were guys that were on lists. They were guys that were in a bad yard. They were, uh, no, they weren't just, you know, that's just not how things work. You don't just randomly walk around playing, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Playing suicide doors or something where they're just shooting each other. No, everything, it was calculated once they took the institution. And all the keys that that would mean to the entire institution. My feelings then were, were that it was over with. Because we had um, we had some really very dangerous uh, inmates in this in, the, in, in this institution. When I was released from my cell, the the first place I went was the pharmacy, and and then went and proceeded to consume it, everything I had gotten from the pharmacy. But so that's a well known fact. Also, uh, I'm gonna say, like I said again gonna gonna reiterate i've gone over this i don't know how many times but there was a it was pretty wild it was there was a lot of people uh, a lot of wild behavior a lot of the guys like i said that were um high rate level uh security inmates weren't really organized they all thought they were leaders they all thought they were the you know what i mean the top the metal metal and chingons so um it was kind of like every man for himself type type deal uh, like he said, he went to the pharmacy and that's something they did do. That's well spoken of. You know, uh, everybody talks about a lot of them wanted to get high, you know, so they all went to, uh, to the, to the, the infirmary. They did hit the medicine, you know, and they ended up doing a lot of Xanax, uh, Oxy was there, morphine, things like that. So box and all that type of stuff. They had a, a lot, they hit the pharmacy. So anything that was on hand, they were mixing it and it kind of made them kind of locote. Drugs, just whatever they had. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of liquid Valium and a lot of Demerol and um, I don't know, numerous other drugs. I mean, there was quite a bit. And um, lots of other people there doing the same thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Anybody that could get get up was getting down. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. You hear? That, this is not mental. Anybody who could get up, get up to the infirmary was getting down, he said. The guards who had fled the control center alerted the state police who began to congregate outside the prison at 2.15 a.m. But they didn't storm the prison. 
for fear that the inmates would kill the 12 officers that they had taken hostage. Three of those hostages were being held in cell block three. Again, imagine 12 per for almost 1300. That's it's not even questionable. Those numbers. Raymond Gutierrez, Edward Ortega, and Larry Mendoza. Uh, we were right here, this holding area for mattresses, the three of us. This is as far back as we could come. The bottom of Sabla 3 and as far back as we can. This is where we were stripped naked and gave up all of our belongings. I somehow hung on to my ring. But um, this is where we were being threatened with being raped and so forth for the first day. And so he, he said being raped, He would they, that was one of the things that did happen to him. They were assaulted, battered, sodomized, uh, beat, tortured. You know, they really let the guards have it. And as you guys saw, if you saw my part one, that's why I told you, don't be so sad right now when you hear, uh, when you, when you don't laugh too hard when you hear these guards talking about, you know, that they kick people down the stairs and they beat them up. Like the story does change. You know, it's not a fairy tale ending. Yeah, you know, my deal with, with you. By 4 a.m., negotiations had begun outside the prison, with a handful of inmate leaders putting their demands to the assembled news media. The first list of demands, and this wasn't made public, but it should have been, was for a pool table in every dorm and stakes. This is what they thought about. This is, so when you sit there and you listen to people write that bullshit, Excuse me. Write that garbage about they were they were writing demands for they wanted better living conditions and all of that. No, they weren't. They were there to harm people. <laughs> he said that they, they wanted the uh, better living conditions and all this and all they asked for was a pool table in every dorm. I remember the first guy that uh, died was a guy who normally cleaned up the hall. It was a snitch informant. Had somebody. Uh, first guy they got. Take note what he said. He was a snitch informant. Took a pipe, hit him in the head. A piece of his skull flew up against the wall. Um, body started quivering as he lay on the ground. Uh, I mean, it was like the first death, and you just start realizing, you know, this is a lot of potential to be violent. Just a lot of potential. And and I want to stop it right there when he says that first guy got his uh, skull. If you guys are uh, apt to not hear types of violence things, you should probably tap out now. Because it does get pretty bad, you know. This is the one of the most violent and, and violent. Not only because they kill people, but they torture them in a very, very, very explicit, very. Uh, I mean, there was a when they said they were doing construction one of the cell blocks. We're all gonna go through all this here in the next video. But they uh, cut they cut people's arms off, and they would use that. There was a blowtorch that they were using in that in that block for construction. They used that blowtorch, and they would they would cut people's arms off and saw and, and, and cauterize them. So they would live and then they would, I mean, it just list goes on and on. So tap out if you're not into that kind of stuff. If you are, let's continue on. Just started escalating from there. You could smell a lot of fear. There was a lot of people there that did not want to be there without guards there to um, keep the order and the peace. They, they really didn't like the fact that, that convicts were running you know i mean we that had control of the penitentiary and uh, we've taken care of business how things over there at one point we were walking down the hallway and somebody came and said that there was a tcb brother you know what i mean and this phrase has been blown out of proportion there was an execution squad running around killing people on the blue side of the evening when the dark yeah, and i hate to say it, but this is when it doesn't matter the streets the uh the inside like person like me remember i told you fight or flight uh let's get active you know what i mean just i mean i can't even help it on youtube i start getting hyped up on fool's talk you know i have that warrior mentality where if i see him going like let's go it's gonna be uh you know i used to play football when i when i got out of julie and i was always taught i would always be the first hit him head on boom my helmet, face first into their helmet. That's what I always thought. Hit the biggest dude and hit him head first. Darkness takes control. 
There was an execution squad. And if you can't figure out a way to enjoy the getting off, then you just got to be a bookwormer or something because it's going to happen in the life. There's two and that's period. And there's two ways you can deal about it. Make it rewarding and handle it, you know, hands on or live on your knees. Try to run, take the ass whooping from behind. You know what I mean? And uh, and that's the way I see life. You know? The prison that night and it had a single destination. On down the road. You got all those people down there in cell block four, and it's not each and every one of them, it's just some of them have told on people that are there in prison, many of, of whom had life sentences, many of whom know they'll never see freedom again because somebody down there in cell block four has told on them. You can imagine what happens at the point to where you have people who are in prison for life. They now have the keys to the place where the individual who has put them in prison for life is. This is cell block four. This is where many, many men met their last demise. And it's pretty, I mean, I almost want to say sad. They had it coming. But uh, these men, you're going to see as we go along here. The self-appointed execution squad did have the keys to enter cell block four. But they could not operate the control panel by which the individual cells were opened. Cowering against the back wall of those cells, just nine feet from their would-be killers, the inmates of cell block four believed their bars would keep them safe. They were wrong. Acetylene torches, left overnight by contractors working on the repairs, had been discovered in cell block five. Now every cell could be opened and every score could be settled. The execution squad could go to... Well, this is the part I was about to say that I didn't. These guys had to sit in their cells and watch a gang of fools sitting there <laughs> laughing, sharpening up knives, like going like that to them and shit, you know what I mean? And watch them cut each and every bar one by one by one until they would open it up. Now, remember something in this cell block, there was cell by cell by cell, about 24 cells. They did it cell by cell by cell. And the way they would do each dude when they cut open the cell block and got in was different. They blew up one of their heads. Another dude, they cut his head off. Another dude, uh, they, they, they cut his arm off. Another dude, they, uh, they hacked up with a ax and uh, melted him to the floor with the blowtorch. It gets real. That's why this is one of the most, uh, they said, they call it, uh, you know, hell house, the devil's kitchen, because they say the devil ruled the roost that night. You know, he was in the air and everybody's soul. It's one of the things they say. His actual photos. There was an execution squad in the prison that night, and I understand you were part of it. Is that right? Yeah. Leroy Vigil recently diagnosed with incurable hepatitis B, has decided to speak for the first time of the role he played in cell block four. Uh, I, I went in there to find two guys there that I wanted to kill, you know. And uh, one of them was Jimmy Villa, Jimmy Joe Villa, and the other one was uh, Mike Briones, but Mike Briones was dead already when I got there. And, uh, to be, to be truthful, I, I would have uh, enjoyed every, every bit of it killing them, you know, because uh, yeah. they just, Look at that old school mentality. Even after it went down, after all those years, he's like, I would have enjoyed killing him, but he was already dead. So they killed the other dudes, you know. Uh, my brother's made statements against me. And Jimmy Joe Villa, he, he uh, testified against me in my trial. Yeah, when we took his downtown for trial, so they, 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 he us up. Watch what you do out there, people. I say it on YouTube. I say it every day. I'm a big, huge dude on when it comes to karma. Look over there, dropping dime all these dudes. Oh, you know, trying to probably get less time, trying to do whatever, not knowing that however many years later it would be, it would be their undoing, literally the end of their lives. The one thing they thought that would do to, that they could do to save their lives. 
was that ended up switching around and 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 taking their lives. Think about that shit. Spot on stuff that I never done, and uh, they gave me three hundred years for that. But I All right, we're gonna jump to the next video. You guys make sure you check out part three right now. Finish this up.